Hey, if you're joining with us online, I do want to encourage you, engage this morning. Really join us. Be part of the church. Chat with your online pastor there and our online hosts and be a part of what we are doing. I'm so excited about these next two weeks and our GPS series. It's going to be so good. Um, does anybody else in here have a love-hate relationship with their GPS? Yeah, no kidding, right? I've even programmed mine to sound like an Irish lady. I mean, she sounds beautiful. She sounds nice. I really like her. Until she kind of gives me a little sass, a little Irish sass. I told you to turn left back there, Wayne. What are you thinking? No, she doesn't quite say it like that, but I feel like it. I feel like it. Have you ever been there? I tell you this one time, my son and I were, we wanted to just have a little overnight getaway, a gathering, my younger son Colby and I. So we took off and we, we found this little state park, not far, just a couple hours from our house that we'd never been to before. We thought, well, we'll try something small. It looked like a little small. In fact, it looked like it was kind of nestled on the, along the water in, out of, just outside this neighborhood. So we got there really late after work one night, and it's pitch black, and we're in this neighborhood in these little one-lane winding roads, and there's no streetlights. It's just dark. We did see a sign for the parks, and we knew we were kind of in the general area, but we didn't really see an entrance. And then the GPS starts telling us, you know, you're left in 500 feet. And I'm looking 500 feet, and I don't see anything that looks like a left, but maybe it's dark. I'll cross. So pretty soon it's, you're left in 100 feet. You're left. In, I'm looking at Kobe. Do you see a left-hand turn? Turn left. There's no, it's a rock wall on our left, a 10-foot rock wall that's kind of getting smaller as we're going forward. So I'm thinking, well, maybe right at the end of the wall where it meets the street, there's a left, you know. So I keep crawling forward, and yell, Kobe just screams, stop! And I hit the brakes. And in my headlights, maybe a few feet in front of my truck, is the harbor. We were on the boat ramp. We just sat there. I'm just like freaking out. I'm, I'm, I'm quiet. My eyes are big. I look over him. His eyes are big. And in the middle of the silence right there on the boat ramp, the voice from heaven breaks the silence. Recalculating. Yeah, no kidding. That's how he's ever been there. Your, your, your destination is 500 feet on the right. Your destination is 50 feet. I'm looking at an empty lot. It's not a Rite Aid store. It's gravel. I can't get my medicine at a gravel. Your destination is right on the right. There's nothing on the right. Recalculate. Yeah. Recalculate. I'm going to recalculate something next time you talk to me, I'll tell you that. So we are recalculating these next two weeks. In fact, the title of my message today is GPS Recalculating Myself. Recalculating Myself. My big idea today is simply this, that we all have... GPS. We are, each of us, masterpieces. We are uniquely gifted and wonderfully made for purpose. And we need to continue to recalculate ourselves to stay on purpose. We're going to spend some time in these next two weeks recalculating ourselves towards something very specific, towards serving our purpose. Recalculating ourselves towards serving our purpose. Can I tell you something? The church needs you serving in your purpose. North Church, we need you serving in your purpose. Spokane, our community, our region, needs you serving in your purpose. The world needs you serving in your purpose. So that's why these next two weeks are going to be so very important for us. You know, we are each masterpieces uniquely made to serve for purpose. Now, I know that because you're nice Christian people, you're so nice, such a beautiful little Christian family, that like me, if I were standing in your shoes and Pastor Mike was up here saying, we need you, you're a masterpiece, Wayne, I'd be going, amen. And I know you're going to be just saying, amen. Yeah, thank you very much. I know you're with me this morning. But here's the problem. I can nod my head when somebody else says it to me. But if I'm being honest, I'm not sure that I live in my every day. Like, I really believe I'm a masterpiece. I'm not sure that I live like I'm fully convinced that I'm a masterpiece. In fact, I'm not sure that I treat other people like I'm fully convinced that they're masterpieces. I'm just not so sure. So if that's you today, I'm going to invite you on this journey with me. You know, in Ephesians 2, when the Apostle Paul is reminding us where we are in this equation, he says, this isn't by you. You are saved through faith. It's a gift from God. It's, 
It's not from you, lest you should boast. But he also tells us this as he's humbly reminding us and putting us in our place. He says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that, what? We can do good things. Things that he has planned for us long ago. You were not created to be a masterpiece so that you could sit on a shelf somewhere looking good. You were created for purpose and to be serving. Your gifts are not yours. They were yours to serve and steward. Your passions are not yours. You're yours to serve and steward. Your story is not yours. It was created for good things that you can do. He reminds us we have a purpose. Can I tell you something this morning? I am a hot mess of a person. You wouldn't have to get to know me more than like a week, and you'd be like, dude, that guy is really something else. I mean, I make a mistake at just about everything. I can't even walk in the door. You know, I'm here for like two weeks on staff, and I've shattered my arm and my wrist, and a week later I walk in with a broken leg, and, uh, and, and I have to pull over on the freeway because I notice that the heater in the car is on an even num- or on an odd number, and I only like it on an even number. And <sighs> Lord have mercy. I can't choose lunch if my wife's not with me. I'm a mess, but you know something? If I stay in that frame of mind and always be thinking about the things that I'm just kind of mess up in life and the mistakes that I make and the way that I'm wired, I can really discount the fact that God has created me that way for a very specific reason. I just think to myself, well, God did have a purpose for me. Of course he had a purpose for me. He's God. He's got a purpose for all of us. He loves his kids. But then I screwed up my purpose by being Wayne, and that's not a good verb. When you wane things, that's, that's not good. My kids call it daddy things. Well, yeah, we dadded that one. But we can't out-mistake God's plan. It doesn't matter what's happened to me, what sickness I've faced, what hurt I've faced. It doesn't matter what mistake that I've made. You see, because of all these things, I did not blow the purpose God had for my life. God doesn't work that way doesn't work that way. When I'm thinking and feeling that way, by the way, what happens is I need to do some recalculating, right? I need to readjust my mind and my thinking. When your thinking is thinking, you need a checkup from the neck up. So I find myself surrounding myself with people who encourage me, want to remind me that I'm God's masterpiece. Have you ever been around people that speak life into you and encouragement? Have you ever had the chance to do that? For someone else, this last week, my wife and I got to spend a little time. Pastor Mike and Tisa took us out to lunch. Man, they're just so incredible. And we're just sitting there, and they're just asking us, how are things going? How are things going in your marriage? How are things going with planting the church? And we had a chance to just talk about some of the great success stories we're having. We had a chance to talk about some of the ways we're kind of failing and feeling, like, discouraged. Like, you know, it's really hard to plant a church. It's really hard to stay focused on our marriage. It's really hard to find quiet time with the Lord together. And, and, and it was amazing, just kind of pouring out this mess on the table. And in their wisdom, they listened, and they smiled, and they encouraged, and they reminded us, yeah, it was hard for us too. Yeah, nothing you're facing is anything new. That's what people go through in the, this position. And, and they reminded us that we aren't alone and that we are masterpieces. And right there in Panera Bread, Booth number three, just around the corner from the water fountain. They breathed life and encouragement. And Cindy and I walked away refreshed again and reminded that the work that we're on and the things we're called to do are for purpose and they are so good. I want to remind you that you're a masterpiece and I want to remind you that you can remind others in moments of great discouragement to just stop and do a little recalculating it helps it helps it helped us that day i remember the first time somebody other than my mom or one of my aunties spoke that kind of value into my life it was the summer between my third and fourth grade year in elementary school what are you like eight nine years old right about then and and um so i'd kind of come from this real broken home situation particularly that season of life when we had to move we were forced to move and so i was in a new house in a new neighborhood in a new school and a new dad who I barely knew, and, and just kind of a messed up season in life. And I had this new friend, he was a great kid, 
And so on our last day of school, we decided we were going to spend the summer together. So we're out kind of at recess, and we ditch recess, and we're out playing in the woods. Now, this is, we saw Bigfoot. And I know you don't believe me. So we decided on the way home that day, that's our summer project. We're going to come back, and we're going to find him. Now, I know a good pastoral story kind of leaves you hanging to the end, but I love you, so I'm not going to leave you hanging. We didn't find him yet. <laughs> so we get back, and we set out on a plan. We put together a budget. We need library cards. We don't know much about Bigfoot. We don't know where he lives. We know he lives behind our school. So we need to go check out some books. We need to research this thing. I need to get to the library, and the tires on my bike are flat. We need new bike tires. We got a budget now for our project, buying library cars and bike tires. We need to figure out how to earn money. My friend's mom teaches us that if you take yarn and crochet around a wire hanger, you can turn an ordinary harsh wire hanger into this beautiful clothes hanger. I mean, there's blue yarn. Did you know there's blue yarn? There's pink yarn. There's yeah, These are so pretty. I'm nine-year-old Wayne, and I'm crocheting up these coat hangers like I'm Joe Creative. DIY, I mean, this, I was on it before there was, even was such a channel on TV. And we hop on our bikes, and we go around, and we start selling these in the neighborhood. I mean, I am convinced I'm going to get everything I need. I'm going to convince every woman in my neighborhood that, oh, you can have those old harsh wire hangers. But look here. Look at these beautiful, multicolored, soft clothes hangers for your delicate feet. Found this little, little wonderful lady. She decided she'd buy them all as long as we'd sit down and have a glass of lemonade with her. Lemonade? And you're going to buy them all? I'm in. I'm in. Before we're done, she puts in an order for more. She wants some blue ones. She wants the multicolored. There is multicolored yarn. Did you know this? You pull it out, it starts yellow. Then it's blue. Then it's red. Then it's, it's incredible. The prettiest clothes hangers you ever saw. So she just starts putting in orders. Bring me 10 blue ones tomorrow. Bring me 10 yellow. And I didn't realize that, of course, what she's doing is she's just loving on this confused kid. Every day she would tell me, you know what, Wayne? I so look forward to your visit tomorrow. Would you come back and bring some more coat hangers for me? Wayne, has anybody ever told you that you're special? I don't know if you've ever heard about God, Wayne, but he's got a plan for your life. I spent most of my summer delivering coat hangers to this house. It's amazing what happens when people speak encouragement and blessing into our life. She was buying my coat hangers, but she was speaking into my soul. She was encouraging my heart. She was focusing my eyes. She was helping me to do some recalculating. And I was loving it. So while recalculating is not, obviously, it's a pretty appropriate theme, right? It's not completely inappropriate. The truth is we're not talking about our global positioning system in our cell phone in the next two weeks. No, the GPS that we're talking about are our gifts and our passions and our stories. And so we're just going to generally cover that a little bit here with the few minutes we have remaining. First of all, our spiritual gifts. You know, there are volumes of books written on the spiritual gifts. I saw a book this week about the 13 spiritual gifts listed in Scripture. I thought there were more than that. I saw another book that said there are 21 spiritual gifts listed in Scripture. That's pretty close to what I've heard. Um, I don't know. I know this. In the next 15 to 20 minutes... I'm not going to have time to describe all the spiritual gifts that I have found in Scripture. But I want to point you to the Scriptures, and I want to say to you, there is a list of spiritual gifts. I want to encourage you to discover them for yourselves. There are a couple that I do want to point out, and I'm going to encourage you to uncover them this week. Go after it. Research. In Ephesians 4, there are the five-fold gifts. These are really commonly known in, in evangelical circles. These are the five-fold ministry gifts, right? There is the apostles, evangelists, pastors, prophets, and teacher. In Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, you'll find this other list of gifts. That included in those are the gifts of exhortation, the spiritual gift of leadership, the spiritual gift of administration, the spiritual gift of mercy. These are all in the scriptures. The spiritual gift of prophecy, of service, of hospitality, like my lemonade friend, of missionary, of martyrdom. There's a spiritual gift of discernment and faith, of healing and helps, of miracles, of, of celibacy. Sorry, that one gets caught up a little bit sometimes when I'm, whew, I don't know who's at it. I know I don't. Words of knowledge, gift of tongues for public edification and the interpretation of those tongues. There's the gift of wisdom. There's this list of spiritual gifts. And this is what I want to say to you. Understanding the list of good, and I encourage you to study them, 
But my main point is this, and I want to read this out of the message version in 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to be reading verses 1, 7 through 8, and then 29 through 31. The Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. What I want to to talk about now is the various ways that God's Spirit gets work into our lives. Because it's complex and it's often misunderstood, but I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is, and everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. There's all kinds of things that are handed out by the Holy Spirit to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. And it's not all apostle, it's not all prophet, it's not all miracle worker, it's not all healer and all prayer in tongues and all interpreter of tongues. You see, some of you keep competing for the so-called important gifts. But I want to lay out for you a far better way. Do you hear what the Lord is saying through Paul to us today, church? Every person is given a spiritual gift. That's just biblical truth. Every person is given a spiritual gift. And it's not just for you, okay? But it's for you to serve. Everyone gets in on it. The master designer and the master craftsman has created a masterpiece work of art. And that masterpiece is you and me. And it's not so you can sit on a shelf somewhere. And look beautiful, but it's so that you can serve. In fact, later on in Corinthians, Paul says to earnestly desire the gifts. Seek them out. Practice them. Maybe you've never taken a spiritual gift assessment test to help you discover your gifts. Or maybe it's just been a long time since you have. This is my encouragement this week. We are giving you the opportunity, and I want you to go home today, and I want you to do it. Hop online. Take this free test. It doesn't take long. And it doesn't have to completely define you. Some online test is not going to define who you are in God. But it can point you to the things that you might already know about yourself and affirm them. And remind you what your spiritual gifts are. And then sign up for one of the classes we've got available this week. And come and unpack it a little bit with us. Okay, on your way out today, you're going to get this card. It says GPS on it. And it's just got this little QR code. And if you're not familiar with the QR code, it's really simple. Point your phone camera at the code like you're going to take a picture of it. And before you even take the picture, a little thing pops up and says, do you want to go to that website? And you just say, yeah. And if that's too confusing or not hard or you don't get it, then simply go to our website. Just go to northchurch.net and click on the GPS event. And it will take you to our website. And you'll find right on that page a link to take the free online test. And then you'll find on that class a couple links to sign up for the classes today or this week. But I want to encourage you to do that, unpack your spiritual gifts, and begin serving in an even greater capacity. So GPS, our G is our gifts. The P in GPS is our passion. What lights your fire? You know, the scriptures are full of people whose passions burned deeply. Moses was so passionate about the Hebrew people and the way they were suffering. Ruth was passionate about love and family connections and her belief that God would provide for her. Nehemiah had a passion to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. Daniel was passionate about praying consistently three times a day, even when it was going to certainly mean his death. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was passionate about trusting and obedient, even in the face of the great magnitude of this calling to carry this child. And Jesus, 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 sweet Jesus, was passionate about you and spending eternity. The master craftsman wants to spend eternity with his masterpiece in you. So search for ways, not only that you're gifted, but how you can apply your gifts in areas where you have passion. Proverbs 20 reminds us in verse 5 that the purposes of a person's heart are deep waters. But one who has insight draws them out desire to seek and find out and draw out your passion in life. Amen? The S in GPS is our story, your story, your unique history and your experiences. Your story may just be the very biggest key to shining like the masterpiece that God has created you to be. And here's why. A very specific reason I say that. You see, there are others who will share your spiritual gifts. 
lot of people might have the gift of administration. A lot of people might have the gift of mercy or of prayer. And there are others who will share your passion. Can I get an amen from the Sounder fans in the crowd? Oh, come on. (laughs) There are other people who will share your passion. But there is nobody, and that nobody that comes from the Greek word, nobody. (laughs) There is nobody that has your story. Nobody. It is the one thing that when we put our complete GPS together, creates us or makes us or signifies that we are incredibly unique. Your unique set of circumstances, your family ancestry, your history, your parents' successes and the way they raised you, your parents' failures and the way they failed you, their faults, your faults, the home you grew up in, the neighborhood or the land that helped to define you, your education, your moments of your greatest pain and your seasons of your greatest joy, the times you walked away from God, and the times you walked with him. Nobody has your story. And there's a piece in this puzzle that only you can fill because of your unique story. That combination of spiritual gifts, passion, and your unique story is your GPS, and it truly sets you apart as a unique masterpiece in the purposes of God's kingdom. And this is why it gets so hard for us. This is where the rubber meets the road, why we can all say amen in here, but it gets so hard come Monday morning. You see, the very thing that is the most unique about us, the very thing that is the biggest key to our living out our purpose, our story, is the very area that causes so many of us to settle in a land short of our calling. Because this is what happens. Tell me if this doesn't resonate. The one thing God wants to use most is our story, but the one thing the enemy uses most against us to throw us off track is our story. You see, we're convinced that the good parts of our story that we like, the successes, the things that look good, the problem is even though they're good, they don't measure up to everybody else's good part of their story. I mean, I could give you the most brilliant moments of my life, but when I match it up to Pastor Mike Meads, so I hide it. And then there's the bad parts of our story, the horrible times, the painful times. And those just bring shame if we don't give them to the Lord. So I've got the bad parts of my story that I want to hide in shame, and I've got the good parts of my story that don't measure up to your good parts of your story. And so I sell my story short. I want to encourage you, if I can say it this way, respect your story. If you really believe you've given your life to God, then your story is his. And you living anything less than your authentic life with all of its bumps and bruises and ugly parts is less of a life of worship to God than you giving it all to him and allowing him to use it all. Don't polish it, don't paint it up, don't diminish it, and don't downplay it. Handle it carefully. Handle it lovingly. Handle your story with open hands. Allow Jesus to invade your story. Allow him to use the chapters already written, no matter how bad or how good they are, to redeem them for his glory. And then allow him and invite him in to author the remaining chapters. Isaiah 48 reminds us, See, I have refined you, but not with silver, and I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Yeah, that fire you felt and things were burning off, God's going to use that. Philippians 1.6 reminds us, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you, come on, will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. If you are going to just pick one little chapter at the beginning of your story, and discount everything else, you are saying God is not great enough or big enough to use everything that he's been a part of all along. God can redeem every little piece of your story to create a masterpiece that you can't even yet imagine. Because it's not just that you're a masterpiece, and this is one of the keys we need to have in mind. It's not just that you're a masterpiece. It's that your masterpiece has a part to play in God's overall picture of his greater story and his greater masterpiece. Have you ever finished a thousand-part puzzle missing one piece? 
Oh, I know you cut the little cardboard thing out thinking it would fit in there, but it ain't the right color and it ain't the right thickness. And everybody that walks by the table sees that it's sitting there with one piece missing. Church, North Church cannot afford to have a piece missing in the story that God is writing on her heart. The church in Spokane in our greater region cannot afford to have a piece missing on the story that God is trying to create. The master craftsman has a piece of artwork that is this world and a plan for it. And he needs all of the pieces involved and engaged. My Bible college dorm room faced about 50 feet across the lawn from the most beautiful stained glass windows I have ever seen in my life. They've been created by a famous French artist, world-renowned, and globally people came from thousands of miles and all around the world to tour these windows. This is them. This is my view from my dorm room for two years. There were seven windows on each side of the chapel, 14 windows total. They were each window 40 feet high. They depicted the seven stages of the cross. The artist called the artwork together as a combined artwork, the way of Mary's sorrow. They were gorgeous. And I would stare at these windows all night long. Well, it was either staring at these or doing homework. So I stared at these windows. I was always amazed that each piece of glass was just this broken, misshaped, jagged, colored nothing, but somehow placed together in the right time and shape and place and position. Maybe you feel like this. Maybe you just kind of see yourself as broken, jagged. In fact, if anybody got too close to this, they'd probably hurt them or cut them, so I'm just going to make sure I stay my distance. And it's not pure. It's not clear. It's sort of colored, dark, dusty. If I found it on the ground, I'd probably pick it up and discard it so that others wouldn't get hurt. I don't see any use for this. I can't pour water into it. I can't look through it. I can't put it in my car windshield. I mean, it's just discarded, messy, broken glass. But oh, if you give your story to Jesus. The thing is, this is the exact piece he's looking for. It's just that sharp and just that shade of that color and just the right shape because he's building a masterpiece that people all over the world need to see. And he's missing a piece sometimes, and sometimes that piece is you and me. See, we hold on to it, and when I only see myself as this, when I don't see myself in context of God's plan or his masterpiece, I just see myself as broken, so I choose to hide it. I'd rather not show you my brokenness. I'd rather not show you the way I make mistakes. I'd, not, I'd rather not show you the, the pain I've caused in others' lives. See, I see this as collateral damage. Something broke, and this is what was left over. It's just collateral damage. But the Lord sees this, and he sees you as collateral beauty. The Creator's got a place in his masterpiece for a piece of collateral beauty with your name on it. Allow God to use your authentic story in service to him. Don't think that you're too far gone. Don't try to polish up your story or make it prettier or make it somebody else's story. Do not make your story somebody else's story. Do not try to match up what everybody else looks like. Do not try to hide the mistakes you've made and do not be afraid to be confident about the things he's called you to do in your story. You see, anything less than our authentic self is a failure. And God has a plan and a purpose and a destiny for your life, but not for the person you're pretending to be. So give your story to the Lord. Seek out your gifts. Discover them. Find your passion. Allow him to move. When the prophet Jeremiah received a vision from God in Jeremiah 18 he said this I went down to the potter's house and behold he was making a work on the wheels and when the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter he made it again another vessel as it seemed good for the potter to make I've never understood this 
Because in my world, in my life, and in my view, it's either it or it's another. I mean, when I break something, I go buy another to replace it. But God, in a God-like economy that always seems backwards to my thinking, says he made it, again, another. You see, it was another, but it was still it. And while it was it, by the way, he saw it as it was going to be in another. God is going to take your story, and he wants to make it again, which means he's not going to grab another piece of clay. He's going to use the one you have with all the past and all your stuff in it, just like it is. But he's going to make it another. You will always be it again, another in the hands of a master artist. I want to close by saying this, and if you've got your communion cups, maybe just get those ready. We're going to stand and take communion together in a moment. You don't know 98-year-old Verona Hoff, but I want to introduce you to her this morning. I wish she was here so that I could in person. She's one of the most powerful, brightest, beautiful women I've ever met and known in my life. Years ago, Verona wanted to use her gifts, so she discovered and took tests and learned through her life that her, she had a gift for hospitality. She had the spiritual gift of hospitality. She had the spiritual gift of discernment and prayer. She had a spiritual gift of wisdom. But she had a passion for youth and youth ministry. Now, Verona's kids were long grown and gone out of the house. She was not of what we would think of as the typical age for a woman who walked in here and partied with Pastor Kenny and Pastor Jacob and danced around on the stage and played games with the kids. So what do you do? Maybe you're there. Maybe you thought, well, these are my gifts and these are my passions, but I don't see a place at North Church for that. You come forward, just like she did. She went to the youth pastor. She said, what can I do? Because this is where my passion is. So they prayed with her, and they said, hey, what if, what if we connected you with some of the kids that we're having a hard time connecting with, and you just prayed for them? What if we introduced you to them on Sunday morning, you know, when we're busy and we don't have time because we're putting on all this program, that you walked over and you encouraged them? What if you found time during the week when we don't have time to have those kids over at your table? Hey, you don't have to play games and jump up and down on the stage to make an impact in our youth ministry. We'll make the connection for you. So they gave her a list of names. And one day she walked up and said, you're Wayne, aren't you? And I was 14 years old. I'd never met her. I didn't know many people at the church. I just started coming to youth group. But it's Sunday morning, and so I thought I'd come. And I said, yeah, and she just sat me down. She said, tell me your story. Wayne, do you know that God's got a plan for your life? Two or three Sundays later, she's talking to me every Sunday. She says, you want to come over to the house and meet my husband this week? So I'm over at her house. For lemonade. <laughs> Never turn down a good glass of lemonade. And she's praying with me. And she's reminding me that I'm special and that I'm a gift. And when my parents were drinking and partying and I couldn't go home, her husband Carl calls me up and says, Why don't you come stay at our house tonight? And it became a second home. And when I was trying to figure out what to do after high school, she said, Why don't we pray together about Bible college? Wayne, I see a ministry in your future. I believe in you. You are a masterpiece. And at the last minute, I switched plans and went to Bible school. And after Bible school, she prayed with me about a mission trip, and she supported two years in Europe. And when I came home, she prayed with me about my relationships, and she was there the day Kenny and I got married. Almost, what, 25 years later, a couple years back, we had occasion to go back to our old church for a memorial service, and we were just driving through the old neighborhood, kind of reminiscing like you might do. And on our way out of town, we hadn't been there for years, we thought, let's just drive by where Verona used to live. Man, I loved her. I don't even know if she's still in that house. It's 10 o'clock at night. We're not going to stop. We're just going to drive by and reminisce. We go by the house. The curtain is open in the front window. The light's on. We slow down. We're kind of looking in the window. And out of nowhere, her grandson and her son and his wife walk by the window. They'd moved out of town years before that. We'd been in contact with them. Didn't know what they were doing in town. We're not going to miss this chance. We pull over. We get out of the car. We go knock on the door. They open the door. Invite us in. Within seconds, we're having lemonade. And, and you know what? We didn't, it didn't take 30 minutes, an hour to catch up on all those years between us. Within minutes, they were speaking encouragement and praying for us and blessing our life. And on the way out the door, I was just feeling melancholy. I didn't think I'd ever be in the house again. I was just stopping and kind of looking around and breathing it in and trying to remember all my times there. 
looking at Verona, wondering if I'd see her again. I had opened the door to leave, and she kind of moved me aside a little bit so she could close the door because behind the door was the closet. Funny, I'd never noticed the closet the whole time I'd been there. And she opened up the closet to hand us our coats, and she pulled the coats off of each yarn-covered wire coat hanger. I'd never put it together. I'd never, never put it together that that was the same. But when you take your gifts and you match them with your passion and you're not afraid to share your story, oh, the lives that God will do and use and impact for his kingdom. Would you stand with me today? We often take communion together and we're going to do that again this morning, but we're just going to do it a little differently. I just want to remind you that this is the body of Christ broken for you and on the night he was betrayed, Jesus broke the bread and he said, do this in remembrance of me. And He said, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And every time you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. But really what he was saying is when you gather and you remind yourself you're each other's masterpieces and you're my masterpiece, come to the table, come back to where the The master artist invites you to always commune with him. There is no veil between he and us anymore. So this morning what I'm going to invite you to do is just take communion right there in the privacy of your own seat. Just you and the Lord. Just take both elements as you desire in your own timing. But I'm going to ask you as you commune with him, as you spend a couple minutes or just a couple seconds with the Father today, would you pray these things? Lord, I come to the table and I ask, reveal to me my gifts. Stir in me the areas where I'm passionate. And God, help me, free me up to give you my whole story, my real authentic story. Help me not to hide the broken pieces in shame. Help me to not cower in false humility from the successes. Use my story. God, help me discover my gifts, stir my passions. God, I give you my story. Let's take communion right there in the quietness in your own heart for a moment. God, use my gifts. Lord, help me discover them. Lord, even if I've been in a rut and I think I know what they are, let me just stir it fresh again. God, stir passions in me. Maybe passions I've never dared to dream about. Maybe things I've, I've run away from. Stir them new and fresh. God, if I've allowed my passions to just sort of flame out, would you fan the flame this morning? And God, my story, my whole story, all of my story. Help me to own it. Help me to just trust and be confident that you can use it and never have to cower or feel insecure or shame because of it. God, would you show me this morning, show me now how you want me to use my story. Lord, I'm available to you. God, use me, use me, use me, use me. There are thousands of 14-year-old Wayne Ferris's in this community that need you. Thank you, Lord. Maybe you can just sing this with me. I hear you call and I am available. I say yes, Lord. I am available. I hear you call, and I am available, and I say, yes, 
Lord.